Hello and welcome to the sixth webinar in our series of Designing Healthy Spaces Post-COVID-19. Today the topic is Redefining Healthcare Spaces. We've all been, uh, we've all been thanking our, our healthcare professionals and we've, and we've been seeing a lot of these images where, where the healthcare uh, workers are the front line uh, against the fight against COVID. So how can our healthcare system and our healthcare infrastructure be safe, healthy, and efficient post-COVID? What are the learnings from this, which we have to incorporate going forward? So um, we've again categorized it into three main uh, parameters, uh, safety security, which we'll talk about uh, rethinking on the hierarchy of hospital system in India, uh, how, how material and people flow in the, in the hospital, and creation of thresholds, and then hygiene. Um, and foremost, the, the first uh, important factor in this is how can we reduce congestion in hospitals? Because only then can we start implementing things like social distancing, sanitizing, using touchless equipments, antiviral coatings, cleaning SOPs, and awareness programs. And then the, the final uh, parameter is, is healthy spaces, where we're talking about creation of specialized departments uh, for infectious diseases, indoor air quality management and efficiency of all services and the guidelines. So what are the hospital hierarchy and protocols in, in, in India currently? So uh, mostly uh, next to a residential area, there is always a polyclinic or a medical center, which is our first, um, first sort of uh, uh, point of, uh, point of health, health services. And it, it's now going to be very important that we start having uh, isolation rooms in in these polyclinics, as well as uh, you know initial testing uh, facility available for infectious diseases. And once the patient is is detected, then he or she can be transferred to the correct hospital, which has a department of uh, infectious diseases. So it's going to be very important that hospitals start having a separate wing or a separate department for infectious diseases and not. Uh, not use the current uh, facility of the wards or the ICU, etc., for infectious disease treatment. Now, of course, there'll have to be each hospital will define clear protocols for their doctors, nurses, and attendants to screen and check patients. And then, of course, there has to be flexibility in design because if there is an emergency, if there is a pandemic, then at that particular time we have to have more beds. We have to create. Uh, beds. So, you know, things like uh, container, uh, container driven uh, hospitals, which can be set up quickly, or ICUs that can be done in containers, or maybe public spaces or large buildings can ease can quickly be turned into into additional beds, etc, for if there is a pandemic in future. So all these, um, all these things will have to be thought through and, and analyzed. Uh, then we come to the flow assessment. Uh, before we actually start defining areas and activities that we can take up in healthcare buildings, uh, we have to do a clear understanding of the existing facility. And if it's a new facility, then we have to design the flow charts and how the movement of people, material services, and logistics will happen. Uh, a lot of times we focus on the people movement uh, because it's the patients, the doctors, the staff, the nurses, and the workers in the hospital. Uh, so their path is, chart, is, is charted, and then you have to also superimpose that with the supply chain, the material, equipments, medicines, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are actually uh, essential to to run the hospital. And and this uh, this is very important because there is a lot of chance of contamination uh, spreading through the through through the the, the chain that that the material etc. Uh, goes through in the hospital. And then, of course, the services, so that we don't end up, uh, uh, we, we sort of streamline the services and don't end up creating a chance of contamination through the service network. And then the logistics and external development. So uh, vehicular movements, et cetera, will need to be charted and, and a clear-cut uh, protocol will have to be developed for, uh, for this movement. Once we've got the once we've got the flow assessment and the flow charts of of the healthcare premise, then we can start building in thresholds. Thresholds are very effective ways to to ensure that the contamination is contained, and it's like a buffer zone where you can screen, sanitize, 
etc uh, etc et and uh, so some examples i mean we've looked at a typical uh, medium scale hospital uh, uh, of one of our projects and we and the blue areas highlight the type of thresholds that can be created so that at the main entry and then at the uh, at before the vertical circulation as and then and before you know all the department entries we create these thresholds where you can actually sanitize and control and 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 make sure that you know if there is a contamination it does not enter the premise in, inside similarly on the on the icu or, or, and the and the ot uh, floor again you have to have these thresholds so that you are you are you are keeping the contamination at bay and of course using uv uv lights as disinfectants and and you know uh, sanitization stations use of gloves and pass through windows uh, is very important then we come to the hygiene what is the new hygiene for healthcare buildings and the first and foremost like i said earlier is reduce congestion and then you you can do the other things like social distancing sanitizing uh, contactless equipment antiviral materials uh, cleaning schedule sops and awareness programs so uh, how do we reduce congestion in a hospital uh, we've highlighted three key areas where the maximum congestion we feel happens in a in a healthcare uh, facility uh the first is the opd area which tends to be extremely crowded uh, haphazard and uh, you know uh, in in the current scenario uh, opds have to be streamlined and then the investigation areas you know the the labs because uh, nearly everyone who comes to the hospital ends up uh, going visiting the labs and and uh, getting some test or the other done and that tends to be overcrowded and then the pharmacy section because it's a centralized pharmacy in most hospitals uh um, you do find a lot of rush at at the pharmacy um uh, in in the hospital so when we look at the opd area uh, the the first thing is tele appointments for non critical or follow up patients a lot of hospitals have already started this in in the lockdown and it's a simple tool whereby the patient can be at home and they can book an appointment and do a do an appointment via a video conference with the doctor uh, this this is a simple way of doing it it's it's comfortable it's easy and extremely safe uh, in in these times and uh, you know the 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 test can be done earlier everything is loaded onto the portal of the hospital where the which the doctor sees so he has all the reports with him before the appointment and it's just a very simple way of doing uh, doing a, a a normal opd appointment without the hassle of going to the hospital and and getting a chance of of you know contamination and then when you have critical patients these these are going to be uh, important protocols that would have to be defined as to how do we tackle the critical patients or the patients who have to come in for the OT, uh, opd into the hospital um a, a simple flow chart here talks about you know uh, the appointment should be set earlier uh only the patients uh, which have a specific uh, time slot can enter the building of course the emergency wing will act, will will operate randomly but uh for the normal crit uh, opd of critical patients they can always you know schedule it and reach the hospital at at, at the appropriate time so that there is less a crowding um ensure that you know once the registration happens ensure that you know all masks sanitizers etc are available for for everyone to use and then the waiting space now waiting space is is where a lot of the congestion happens um we are proposing that there should not be central waiting areas uh, for the opd opd uh, chambers in fact there should be segregated uh, small um, waiting places right outside the consultation room also what we're saying is that we have to decentralize the opd so in in a lot of hospitals we still have a centralized system of opd where the entire opd happens at one one place and this is a source of contamination we need to start having department wise opd so let's say uh, you have a pediatric department so the opd for the pediatric department happens in its in in the department itself the oncology department has their own opd area so uh, thus we are actually uh, decentralizing and and uh, the entire uh, uh, you know opd and the patients that that are availing that facility 
Then uh, the next point is regarding the labs and the investigation. Uh, we can easily start implementing mobile or mobile lab facilities. There's a lot of home, uh, uh, you know, testing available at your home. Uh, and mobile facilities are a great way to, at least uh, for the simple tests, you can easily uh, ensure that, that, you know, the patient is not entering the building and overcrowding. He can just have a, a, the, you know, the required test done in his own car and drive away and the report is emailed or sent to him uh, you know once it's ready then we have the 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 social distancing i mean um, use of tapes making squares putting putting staggered seats etc etc can needs to be implemented so that we social distancing is properly implemented in hospitals and then uh, another, uh, uh, this slide actually shows that, you know, the, the common areas, the areas where you still anticipate a crowd, proper queuing system or, you know, screening systems should be done so that, so that we avoid this uh, overcrowding and extra congestion in areas. Even in toilets, we have to ensure that, you know, proper social distancing is maintained. And then, of course, regular sanitization, disinfection, use of UV towers, uh, etc etc so that you know we can actually uh, ensure that we are continuously sanitizing and disinfecting the, the facility and then some interesting equipments will now start uh, being used you know a lot of touchless uh, equipments like you know the vertical transport the taps uh, sanitizers um, then uh, probably we don't need to use the fabric uh, blinds or curtains anymore. Maybe we, we start using switchable glass, which can be sort of made opaque or uh, open or controlled uh, as and when required. And the key staff, which is actually manning, you know, the, the larger floor area or where the, where the waiting areas and, and greater interaction with, with people is, we probably need to give those professionals a pressurized helmet, etc. And then antiviral materials like copper, et cetera, or coatings, uh, cleaning schedule for SOPs and awareness programs and drills, you know, by virtue of signages, by virtue of simple pledges for the in-house uh, working workers, et cetera. Then we come to healthy spaces. Uh, I mean, we all, uh, we all go to the hospital to get treated and, uh, and we all expect the hospitals to be healthy and safe and a key, key point here is that we have to eliminate cross-infection. So that's why we're proposing that there should be specialized departments uh, now. And then indoor air quality has to be uh, thought of very, very carefully. Uh, and then, of course, efficiency. And then uh, for, for all, the, all the staff of the hospital, there should be some facility for restrooms and breakout rooms because uh, they may uh, need to be in the hospital for a longer duration uh, than earlier. So, um, like we were discussing earlier, by specialized departments, we mean that instead of having things that are that are in one place, we need to have departments for every activity. A lot of the hospitals already have it, and now there should be a specialized department for infectious diseases. And this will have a unique planning and design methodology. Uh, we've put forward two case studies. Uh, one is the Rush Medical Center, which actually added, a, which has a separate wing for uh, infectious diseases and they pioneered the idea of having negative pressure in the room. So all the rooms have negative pressure. So there is no inflow uh, of air from the room to other parts of the hospital. There is no return air taken from the room so that there is no chance of contamination spreading through the HVAC and ventilation system. Um, in, the second one is the Skane University Hospital uh, in which they implemented a system of, um, of actually uh, moving the patients from outside. So there is a central area reception or whatever registration area you may call it on the ground level. And then there are two sets of vertical transportation and corridors. One set is outside. So the patients are taken to their rooms or to any lab or testing area or wherever they need to go through an external vertical circulation and uh, there is a there is a corridor which wraps around the building. So the patients are taken from outside, and the indoor corridors, etc., are used by the hospital staff and nurses and doctors. And then indoor air quality. A lot of guidelines have come in. Uh, Ishray has issued specific guidelines for uh, for hospitals, and it clearly says that you 
that all return air ducts should be blocked from the room. So the rooms, while you will feed in uh, the cool air into the rooms, you will not take the air back into the HV system from, from the Department of Infectious Disease. There will be a designed uh, exhaust system uh, which would have HEPA filter so that this air is filtered and taken out of the building. And, uh, and, and because there is no return air taken from the room, um, this air is not mixed with the with the air being supplied to other areas of the hospital. Um, the, uh, then, of course, you know other other guidelines that Ishtray has issued for for general air conditioning also apply. You know, like use of MERV filters, UV lamps, etc., to to ensure that you know pollutants and contaminants are cut down. Uh, we should also start using using indoor air quality plants. You know, like Erica Palm and Mother's Tongue and Money Plant. To, in, to, to enhance the indoor air quality and make hospitals more healthy. And then efficiency in services, you know, the energy, the water and the waste management has to be carefully planned and designed. Uh, mostly all hospitals are already following this, but we have to revisit the protocols and make them even more efficient, you know, like use of garbage chutes and, you know, segregation of waste, ensuring that we are conserving energy, we are Sort of generating our own energy as well and in general you know there everything should be thought of from a from a standpoint of health and efficiency uh, reusing water etc uh, waste management has to be very very carefully looked at because it's a it's a very simple and quick medium of transferring contamination so we have to be sure that we have our waste management protocols in place and they are being being followed and then finally i mean uh, the, the the healthcare staff is the most affected by by these by these pandemics and we have to plan good restrooms and breakout areas so that you know they they can recharge themselves and and you know be ready for the next assignment so you know use a biophilic design ensuring that you know uh, there are a lot of spaces which connect you with nature and help you help you calm down uh, ensuring that there are beds, either foldable beds or, you know, there are proper spaces where they can rest, um, cafeterias which they can use and, you know, just recharge themselves because the healthcare workers are the, are the heroes when it comes to pandemics. And then the government as well as the WHO have issued a lot of guidelines, you know, for, uh, for infection prevention in healthcare facilities and it's it's worth taking a read through them and very simple uh, guidelines, you know, like hygiene for, for PP equipment, um, you know, uh, ensuring that things are thing, that that infection or, uh, uh, or, or contamination does not spread. Uh, you know, it's very important to use them. Um, for example, you know, this, uh, this image shows a simple hospital, uh, hospital OPD chamber and uh, how we should orient the the desk so that you know uh, through the window the you know the contaminant even if there is a contaminant it blows outside and not circulates within the room uh, how the bed should be placed what is the what is the the facilities to be given there how can we actually uh, control um, contamination outbreak and of course you know the waste management and what are the categories of, of the bio waste and how it can be uh, taken care of and these principles are extremely uh, important to be adhered to. So thank you so much. I hope you liked the presentation and please spread the word. Let's start a discussion and ensure that our healthcare facilities are healthy and ready uh, post COVID uh, for any, any further uh, pandemics or infectious diseases that may come about. So thank you very much and uh, good day.